Hi, everyone. Sayersville is home to the Field of Dreams. Today, we will see how fields of pasture can infrastructurally be set for farrowing pigs. So good afternoon. Uh, my name is Talise Christie with Pastoral Farmers of Iowa, and accompanying me behind the scenes is Phoebe. Uh, today, we'll be broadcasting with Jude Becker of Becker Lane Organics in Dyersville, Iowa, to learn about how he manages his organic farrow to finish operation. And we will see how um, his water line and fencing on pasture are set up. Uh, before we start off with Jude, um, we just want to take a brief moment of appreciation to help um, to appreciate those who help us provide such great programming for you all. So we'd like to uh, thank all of our major sponsors for their support of our entire field day this season. Uh, their support, uh, their support uh, helps us make this virtual field day season possible, which features over 60 virtual field days. Thanks to all of our sponsors, and you can see them there on the screen. A little bit more about Patrical Farmers of Iowa. PFI is a farmer-led organization. Our mission is based on equipping our farmers with the resources to build resilient farms and communities. And we achieve this by helping farmers connect to one another and share knowledge in a variety of ways. So we invite you to learn more about our organization and access our collection of resources at practicalfarmers.org. And a few housekeeping reminders. Uh, this field day will run until about 1.30. If you have any questions for Jude uh, during the field day, please type them in the comment box on Facebook and I'll definitely try my best to relay them to Jude during our discussion. And then when we're done, please let us know how you thought about this virtual field day. Virtual events are new to us, and with your help, we're really excited to learn and improve throughout the season. So please share your feedback via a brief online survey that we'll post in the comment box at the end of the field day. And also, for all of those who filled out a survey, you'll be entered to win a PSI-branded water bottle. So, woo, merch, and swag. Uh, so without further ado, let's go live to Jude. Uh, Jude, thank you for taking the time to host us today. So I'll turn it over to you. Awesome. Thanks so much, uh, Salides. Uh, I know the work you guys do at, at uh, Practical Farmers of Iowa has oftentimes helped me and inspired me over the years. So I'm really glad to do this with you guys today. And everyone out there, uh, welcome to my farm. Uh, welcome to uh, Dyersville, Iowa. And it's a, it's a beautiful day here at the farm. It's about almost 80 degrees, low humidity, not a cloud in the sky. So this is the you know great season of the year to be able to be able to uh, show you guys everything we do, or at least a part of it. And it's funny, Salise, because I know a couple years ago I had a a small field day or a farm tour for the rye we grow. That's a special kind of cereal rye. And I thought, gosh, if I could have another farm tour to show my pig my pig farming and things like that, it would be a lot of fun. But um, the circumstances we're in right now, I know it's it's a little weird, but even the, the, the positive side or the silver lining of this is that even though not everyone can physically be here, some people who wouldn't otherwise be able to come to any tours I had can join us in, in a virtual way. So that's that's the silver lining. Um, so yeah, we're gonna, I think we're gonna, uh, right now I'm standing on kind of north of my, uh, one of my barns and then we're gonna show a video. I, I made a couple of videos already because it was going to take too much time to walk around everywhere and we only have one hour so a couple of weeks ago i made a video showing other parts of my my farm and we can play that and then i'm going to be after the video is finished i will be in my pasture where we have some small baby pigs and their mothers hanging out right now and i'll um, I'll, I'll explain that and um yeah so we can i guess we can show those videos now Great. And we'll go to that. So, hello everyone. It's a uh, Saturday evening and I'm I've decided I'm going to do a, a quick video. Uh I'm making a few videos before the field day because that will make the use of our time together, I guess we have about 1 hour uh, more efficient because otherwise I'm going to have to walk all over my farm and 
I think you've got better things to do than just watch me walk around. Um, so I'm making this video now to show you guys uh, one of my one of my pastures out here. It's uh, where we keep uh, at the moment pregnant sows, and as you can see, it's just rained a bunch, so there's some some mud areas, but. Uh, more or less, we've just enclosed this area. We've chose the spot on the farm on the uh, inward side of a windbreak to keep some wind off of off of the uh, pigs whenever we can, especially in winter. We've got a water fountain uh, right there that I uh, had dug a water pipe for and just poured like a eight foot by eight foot concrete pad. So anytime we want, we have water. Um, four seasons of the year. Okay, so here are the two huts I was, was showing you guys, and they are 10 by 20 feet long, and these huts have a layer of, yeah, there we can see it, a layer of insulation. So there's a top layer of galvanized steel, and then the bottom layer, and in between is about one inch. So there's one inch of insulation on this, on this hut. And you can see right there, there's a like a bracket on top, so you can take uh, the forks off of your tractor and lift the whole thing up uh, when you want to move it to a, a new spot. Okay, now we're at the back of the same hut, and you can see there's a vent or a window that is adjustable with this uh, with this chain, so you can determine how much air you want to flow into the hut, and also this uh, door. Right there with uh, two uh, pins that act as like closure locks. All right, here we are again, um, Saturday evening, May 23rd. We just had a bunch of rain. It's a totally uh, gorgeous evening. So like I said, I'm trying to do some filming um, ahead of time. And I just wanted to show you kind of um, how, we're, how we're rotating crops and including pigs in that uh, scheme. So if you look out this, this way to the north, we have uh, what I used for a sow gestation area last year in the fall and winter. And we've taken away all the sows uh, because our, our uh, GAP uh, certification, Global Animal Partnership, as well as my own uh, sense of stewardship demands that we have um, a certain amount of vegetative cover all the time. So that means no one place of our no one portion of our land area is occupied by pigs for too long so they don't have a chance to totally denude the landscape so um, in April we uh, sowed uh, oats as a cover crop and to act as a cover crop for my pasture mix here which is um, a bunch of different grasses that I can explain later and red clover and it's looking great right now both the oats and the uh, I can see some some clover um, germinating in here if you guys let's try to zoom in here um, there's some clover and different grasses right there so it's all looking good perfect dude we're back okay. to you okay cool so you just watched me uh, talking about some stuff a couple weeks ago in my pasture, and now we're, we're at another pasture. I'll see if I can point the camera out there. Um, cool. So there, you, there you can. We're looking west right now, and you can see my farrowing field. And I think you can sort of see right in the middle of the shot. There's a one sow standing, and she was standing closer to me, but she was a little bit. Um, not sure what was going on. A weird guy standing in, standing in her territory holding a camera. So she went away, but we're going to walk out there in a second. And there it looks like her piglets are emerging from, from their hut or their house right now. It's, it's over the lunchtime on a sunny day in the summer, most pigs are sleeping or they're hanging out in shade. Um, so before we walk over there, I'm just going to explain a little bit about the overall view you're seeing right now. Um, so this, I'm standing on a pathway that has been uh, graveled because a big, a big issue to take to, to uh, take your pigs outdoors is access. So we have four seasons of the year, as you know, in Iowa, 
And that means sometimes it's raining and sometimes it's snowing. And a lot of the times just driving out here would be very difficult, not fit for machines. So we, we decided to divide the field in an east part on the right side and a west part on the left side and make this rock path. And that way, uh, because we made this investment, we have access here 365 days a year. So we can come down this pathway and we have, for example, there is a feed trough that we can put feed in every day. We have another way to drive out here, uh, bring the animals in before they're due to give birth. We can also come out here and collect them again when we want to move them back into the farmyard. And we can bring straw to the, to the huts so they have uh, clean bedding at any time. Now, you might see that this, this pasture, it looks kind of big. It's actually about six acres on the left side and six acres on the right side. So it's kind of this, this time, this uh, pasture at the moment, it moves around from year to year, but we have it here. And we're thinking we want to keep it here as long as we can, because I've decided that, as you see, it's kind of, kind of wide open and it's getting to be pretty hot today. And pigs are really not fans of, of hot, humid weather. And they have no sweat glands, so they can't sweat. So the only way they can cool off on a hot day like this is to lay in a pool of water and use mud along with the water to coat their skin, reduce parasites. And thanks, Nelson. Nelson's here with me today. And we just uh, turned on, you can see we have this sprinkler system that we can control like every day. Sometimes we turn, turn it on, I'll zoom in. It's just a simple um, sprinkler that I can increase or decrease the flow of water. And we keep these um, wallows that the pigs build themselves um, always with some water in so they can come here any, any time and just cool off. It's really important. But along with the wallow, we are planting, as you see um, at the other edge of the paddock, shade trees. And I was inspired by my friend in Denmark who's done this on a big scale because one of the things that pigs need is shade. And right now they have some shade inside their hut, but I'd really like to do a more, more expansive natural shade system out here. And so we planted a hybrid, a line of hybrid maple trees and they're not, they're doing okay actually. So hopefully in the not too distant future, we'll have more shade available for the sows and piglets on summer days like this. And that's one of the things we're trying to do is provide an environment that is just as close to nature as possible for the pigs. So create, a, create something that we can work in to, to produce an animal for ultimate, uh, ultimately to be butchered and to give us protein, but also to do that in a, in, a, in a way that allows the pig to express all their natural instincts, such as lying in the shade, rooting in, in, in mud and wallowing in it, uh, nesting, and foraging, and here the foraging is done in the grass that we've created and maintained. So I'm gonna walk inside right now. I'm gonna step over. You can see there's a, a uh, this uh, short wood post has a, uh, it's connected to a electric fence. And this uh, black handle, which is the divider, dividing line between that paddock with one sow and her litter of pigs and this one, and every sow there and there and there, we have, so it goes all the way up to the end of the field. We have about 24 or 25 paddocks, individual paddocks on the left side of the field. And the same thing on the other side so that I can manage every sow as an individual. So I could control how much feed she gets every day. We can manage a whole bunch of things much more efficiently and in a better way for the animal if we treat them as individuals. So I'm gonna walk into the how, into the paddock right now. Go ahead. And Jude, Jude how big are, are these, are each of these paddocks? So each paddock is about, let's say, if this is six acres, we're down, we, well, we try, to, we try to do like six sows per acre. So if you look around me, um, every, every sow is about, is having about a sixth, a sixth of an acre. So 
So we're and how hot in. do you heat that that electric fence or that electric line? So the electric fence, um, I buy the biggest and best electric fencer you can get because I, um, I think a lot of electric fences farmers and ranchers buy I, that I see the people who called me they're buying too small, too weak mm. of a fencing unit, and so my, we try to keep it by like this time of the year we have to mow it mow underneath it all the time to stop shorts from grass touching it. So we're keeping at least 3,000 volts, but we really want it up around 5,000 at least. Gotcha. Yeah. So getting closer here to the huts, and I'm going to try to be as stealthy as I can because <laughs> I'm, I see some piglets inside the house. And I'm hoping I can show you guys that without them all jumping out and running away, which they'll likely do anyway. But you might be able to get. I'm going to go to the back side. Actually, that's a good idea. Okay, well, they're running they out. But anyway, <laughs> this is a good way to see inside of one of these houses. They, um, this is really an important part of the farm because. When I started farming, I was using wooden huts that I, that I made out of plywood like we always did in Iowa. And they really just didn't work very well unless it was a picture perfect spring day or fall day when you have sort of medium temperatures. Mm -hmm. And, it, you know, living in the Midwest, that's rare. So I needed something more durable. And I found these in the UK and they were more expensive but actually in the long run they've been a great investment for the farm and they allow for example right now because you can sort of see if I look at the at this wall here the, the wall is thick it's about two inches thick it has steel lining on the interior the exterior and it has insulation so it's even though it's kind of getting warm outside inside it's cooler because the insulation, of course, works both ways to cool and retain heat during winter. Um, mm -hmm. So I'm going to just give, give this uh, over to Nelson right now. Thanks, Nelson. And then I'm going to show you guys a few details on this. So here, these hooks are really important because we can pick up the hut with like a skid loader or tractor loader bucket and move them all the time. So after this sow and her baby pigs, are taken out from this area when they reach six weeks of age, when the pigs, the babies are six weeks old, then we can pick up this whole hut and the straw bedding and all the dirt stays here. So it's important because we are not using antibiotics on the pigs. And if we're not using antibiotics, we want to minimize disease in natural ways. And so one simple concept here, I just describe it like leaving the germs behind. So when we pick this up and move it to a new, new spot on the field, on new grass, put in new straw, then we're leaving the old germs behind, and then the sunshine will shine on this, and the rain will rain on it, and hopefully that, all the bad stuff dies. So a very simple way to create a clean new space for the next sow that comes here in the future with her babies that are yet to be born. Um, so I'll walk around to the front of the house and show you guys. This is the door of the house. And it's a little dirty right now, but you can put it on if you, for example, want to uh, go inside of the house after the sow has given birth and do something. If you have to uh, intervene or uh, help her get her piglets born, you can go in. Sometimes the sows get angry. <clears throat> so if we want to take the sow outside, you can put this door on like this, these two pins and you're safe inside. You can also lock, lock pigs inside the house the same way. Um, can you I ask Nelson to get around, a little closer so we, so we can see? Nelson. Awesome, thanks. So you can take this door and put it the other way, reverse it. So now the smooth side is on the interior and you can have pigs inside, inside the house um, and you've got control. So that's what we do. On the day we're going to wean the piglets, so that means separating the pigs because they're old enough to live on their own away from their mother. We come out here like 5 a.m., lock these doors, 
and hope, hopefully we can do it really quietly so not all the pigs come running out if they hear us. We lock the door and we have the sow and pigs inside. And we can come mm -hmm. up here with our tractor and our cart and then just back the cart up to the door and take this off. And then we can sort of shoe the pigs and sow onto the, onto the cart. It's, it's easy. So Jude, this, can you ask one? Nelson to get a little, a little closer to see the latches one more time? Okay, yeah. To see them latch on and latch latches, off. Nelson. Yeah, so here, here are the latches with springs. And you can put it like this. It's really um, not complicated. And it's these, these these this hut is about ten years old. So, I mean, when I was using plywood huts, I had to rebuild them virtually every season. So, this has lasted a long time. Um, I'll show you what I call the fender, which is right now not in use, but we can put this on the front of the house. The, and what this is for is I just made a front yard in front of my house. Why do I want a front yard in front of my house? So the baby pigs can come out here and play outside, but they don't get lost. Because this grass, if it's let's say 12 inches tall, that's like the Amazon rainforest to a baby piglet. And it can easily get lost in the grass and you know, just succumb to the elements. So this gives What are the dimensions yard. of that of that fender? Uh, so this, the, the fender, it's about, I would say, one yard or maybe maybe a little bit more than that. Maybe, maybe it's one meter from the, from the back to here. And this might be, let's say, 30 inches wide. So the cow can come out of here freely and step over this, go and drink and eat as she wants. So the sow, again, totally free. The pigs have this restriction. And this, I only use this in the first, let's say, seven days of the pig's life mm -hmm. after they're born. And you can easily just take it away again. And is that metal or like sheet metal or? Yeah, this is galvanized steel. Okay. So we just set it like that. Voila. Um, yeah, and you can see some simple things here. Like, obviously, this area has become a little bit denuded because the sow is using it and again we're trying to manage the grass so when we the next the next litter will, as I said we'll move the hut over um, one other detail this clip when it in winter time we use the same field in winter time so we can use this to lock on a we have a piece of plastic like a curtain like a flap that we put on the front of the house and it hooks on these two pegs and this clip holds it down, and it's just like a breezeway flap that keeps helps keep heat inside because one sow on average gives off like one kilowatt of heat per hour. So mm. six months from now, when it's really cold out here, we can keep the piglets warm enough by that strategy. So there's many, many details here, but I'm just trying to give you guys an overall view. And yeah. Thanks, Nelson. Okay, so I'm gonna walk away from the farrowing hut right now. And I'm gonna try to show you guys what I was trying to show you before, which was the sow that lives in here and her pigs. So she's going over right now to the wallow. Let's see and Jude, while you're doing that, can you talk a little bit about your pigs? Like what breed are they? Yeah, so the pigs we use at the farm, so they're a cross between a Berkshire boar and a, a sow that is a part Chester white and part large white. And so you can see mm -hmm. the sow we have here. So she's getting into her wallow and I'm trying not to intimidate her as I approach with only the best wishes in, in my heart. And her piglets are right there. It looks like she has three, six, nine, eleven piglets. 
which is actually pretty good. Yeah. yeah, and they're about a month old right now. So in two more weeks, how many? in two more weeks, we'll come out here and collect the piglets and that I call weaning. Right. How many sows do you have on your farm right now? Okay, so good question. At the, mo at the moment, we have about 100 sows and we have that divided out in groups. So we're, we have one group scheduled to, to give birth every six weeks. So that way we have like a steady flow of pigs and we can also therefore butcher pigs. So we have fresh meat for our customers. We actually butcher pigs every two weeks. Got it. So we have a question coming in here uh, about the farrowing hut. So when you move the farrowing hut, do you reseed the denuded area or will you just have it grow back on its own? So we don't necessarily reseed that at the moment, but we, we come out here every fall. So for example, we come out here and we take down, here's a good way to show this. We take down these, if we have an, an area that's scheduled to be empty, I can just unhook this fence, which is the, these dividing lines. And then we can bring like a tillage tool, like a harrow or disc harrow or something like that, and go over selective spots that are, have been denuded and reseed them. And we need to leave, that's why we need to not, uh, we need to be very, let's say disciplined in how we use this area, because it would be tempting to simply fill the whole thing up with, animal, with pigs. But if we do that, then you don't have that resting period so you need that resting period so you can selectively, let's say twice a year, when it's a good sort of um, temperature range and precipitation range to establish new grass. So that's like April and May and then September and October to come out here and do that. And how long is the resting period, would you say? Well, <clears throat> it, it, it varies, but I would say six to eight weeks um, and we also, so that, that's a good, actually a good question because that's sort of a segue into talking about winter farrowing because we have another field like this that has trees that are more mature that I use in winter time. So we, we try to, um, for example, if we establish grass here in September and October in a section of the field, then leave that field empty throughout the whole winter um, so that sows aren't out here stepping on the fragile new grass. So that field... And before... Okay. Go ahead. Uh, yeah, before we head over to the other pasture, can you talk a little bit about your water lines? So the water lines, let's see if I can find... Okay, I guess right here is a good, a good example of it. So for a long time, I struggled with how to put water out in these fields. And because the field is temporary and uh, we move it sometimes, especially during the growing season, we don't want to have buried water pipe out here. First of all, it's very expensive and it's just very sort of arduous to work with. So I found this company called Unidelta. They're an Italian company and they've really um, done a great job of uh, uh, developing these portable, like long lived water systems for pasture-based farms and ranches. And if you can see this, this pipe is a very strong plastic. It's really thick and durable. It's lasted for years. We can roll it up and reuse it. And these, um, they're compression fittings that, I can get a close up. They're compression fittings that can take my hand to turn it to the left like that. It comes off, I can take it a second away. Um, but it's a very fast way to connect these parts together with needing only my hand as a, as a tool. You don't need pliers or wrenches or pipe clamps or what have you, just simply these pop together. So it's a really universal, um, easy, like low, low tech, but uh, adaptable, durable, long life system. And so those, those pipes lead up to, for example, I'll walk over here. They lead up to a trough, which is uh, mounted on a plate out of steel right there. 
So you can see the steel plate. And on top of the steel plate is this trough, which is made out of recycled uh, rubber tires, actually. And then you have this, there's a T connector right here that comes off of the, the main line I just, I just explained to you. So right there, you can see there's a T connector. And then it goes right there. And it's just like a float, a float. So it stays full of water all the time. And as you can see, all these guys are coming over right now. To check out us and maybe get some water. Um, and can you share away. a little bit about what the what that what a line and what what those line would lines would cost? Yeah, so I don't have that information in the front of my brain at the moment, but I know it's it's about I'm trying to think what I spent for all the pipe for this whole field. It was a, a few thousand dollars maybe to have all the pipe from on two sides of the road across a 20 acre length. So it might be like a mile of pipe or a mile and a half of pipe and then all these fittings, but I've used it for a number of years. So I don't, I don't think it's a very, I'm not too worried about that. I guess I wouldn't describe that as a big onerous cost to, to, to incur. Um, these, these water troughs though cost a little more. They were a few hundred dollars a piece. Um, so, but again, I've, I've had those for 15 years. So yeah, it was an investment, but over, over a long time, it, it definitely becomes um, more negligible. Um, something else that as long as we're here, I'm going to explain not about watering, but about giving feed. So <clears throat> right here is a piece of metal that I took a magic marker and you're wondering why is he putting these numbers on this piece of metal? So because I said before, we're trying to treat every sow as an individual. That means we watch and note and manage how much feed they eat every day very carefully. So right here, this post is the dividing line between that paddock and this paddock. And the paddock on the left has no pigs in it at the moment. The paddock on the right has one sow with her piglets. So I have here a magnet that I move. And so it simply means right now that at number 25 means that the sow is eating 25 pounds of feed every day. So we know <clears throat> how much to put here. I have two, two people helping me do this work on the farm every day. So if the, let's say for example, Owen is one of them and Owen decided let, um, one day that the sow was eating 25 pounds a day. Then if Nelson comes here the next day or if I come here the third day, I know what they did last. So we have a kind of easy way to make a continuity without doing lots of complicated book work. Um, anybody who comes here can see how much feed the sow needs. When the sow farrows, yeah, go ahead. Um, could you repeat the name of the company that you mentioned for the water line? Yes, the, the company is called Unidelta. Unidelta. And the name of the fitting one more time? Uh, the fitting is a. Uh, oh, you can see the. Uh, you can't. It's, not, it's called Unidelta, but that's the the compression. It's a compression fitting. Compression fitting. Okay. So, if it's I was just explaining about the feed. So if it's South Pharaohs, we start her up here about two pounds the first day because I don't want the sow to get mastitis. So when they farrow or when they give birth on the first day, it's two pounds. Then it goes up maybe two pounds a day. So maybe by the third day, it's the, it should be here. But after that point, it's very much an individual sow, depending on how, what her age is, her body size, her body mass, how many piglets she has. So it requires like an individual person's eye to be keen enough and watch this. So we could put this anywhere. So that's, but at the moment, this, this sow has got, after one month, she's kind of, let's say maxed out. So 25 pounds a day is about, I don't know, 11 kilograms or something like that. So that's how much she's eating right now. So I'm not sure if there's any more questions to leave on this field. And if not, 
then I'm going to walk up to the uh, winter winter we growing have, pasture. We do have a question. Um, first about, okay. uh, do you have your own water source or are you connected to like a rural water system? So I have a well. I have a well on the farm and it's, we're very lucky. I was just talking about this the other day because we've got all the water you can ever want in Iowa. All you have to do is pay for the electricity to pump it out of the ground. And I was kind of concerned. I've been doing some testing out here, um, kind of expensive testing. I was worried uh, some, some local wells have been contaminated with things like atrazine and, and glyphosate or Roundup. So luckily we're not because I did some testing uh, at the University of Iowa Hygienic Lab. And so we have, we have no measurable glyphosate or atrazine here. So I'm really thankful for that. Um, so yeah, we have, we, have a, we have a well that gives us good water and we pump it around the farm. But some people don't have, I know some friends of mine are ranching in California and they, they have their access to water is much more complex, shall we say. And as you're walking to the kind of your winter winter farrowing pastures, can you also on that note talk about what your water lines and water systems look like for you know winter water in terms of for the pigs? Yeah, so I'm actually getting close to that point right now. I can show you as soon as I manage to uh, climb this fence. Um, so right now, I will show you. So here we are at the edge of a pasture and I'm underneath some trees, some tall old pine trees that offer shade here, but they also offer a windbreak, which is why we sighted this pasture um, to the east of the windbreak. So it stops the prevailing wind in winter time. And this is where, where we have water during the cold months so I start bringing pigs up here into this field in like late November or early December. And they remain here until April because we have on average cold temperatures and the water pipes I just showed you would be frozen or are frozen. So we need something else. So all along this line of trees from where I'm standing running Running that way, which is dead, uh, due south, we have we have fountains like this, and this is the edge of the of the pasture. So there's a, a, the fence. You can sort of see it there. Um, it's here, and we have this fountain serving. Again, you can see this wire has been this is taken down, so I could reseed all the grass. There's, there's no fencing out there right now, but the fountain is uh, not, it never freezes. So a sow could come here and take her, her snout, let's say, and just open this up and there's water inside there. And our frog friend is escaping. Uh, but so there's water here all the time. And these have, these are fed by uh, a water pipe that's about six feet down in the ground and it, it, so that water underground never freezes and because there's so much insulation on this thing this will not freeze the water at the top will not freeze unless it's about let's say 10 degrees fahrenheit or something like minus 15 or minus 10 celsius and it does get that cold in iowa as you know so we do have on the side of this water there's a this little plastic panel comes off with a plastic screw and there's a, a fuse and some wires and there's a heating element that gets hot enough to heat the water inside here so it doesn't freeze, even if it does get really super cold like it does in January. So this, these have been here for, this has been here since 2005. So 15 years, it, again, this water wasn't cheap. I'm thinking it cost us about $500 15 years ago. I don't know what they would cost now. 
The company is Mira Fount that makes these things. And, but they've been a great investment because where I'm standing right now is under shade, it's protected from the from wind and the sows can be out there uh, in winter in, in these huts and come over here and get water any, any time that they, that they feel like it. So a few other things I wanted to show you guys in this pasture was I showed you already the location of being to the east of the windbreak. That's very important. And it also, it also faces south. So where I'm standing right now is higher than over there. And we have actually a really nice pasture that I planted here last fall. Um, and it's been doing we we it's been doing well. Some and then to the left, you can sort of see a line right there. That out that is a different mix of grasses that I seeded in April. So in April, when we took all the cells off this pasture, we reseeded it again, and it's doing pretty well. So on the right is it's really amazing. It's got lots of bluegrass. It's got hairy vetch, red clover. Uh, some fe two different kinds of fescue, and I think there's a perennial ryegrass, and it, I'm really happy with it actually. Um, on the left, can you, go ahead. Yes. Can you talk about the timeline for seeding and like where you source your pasture seed mix? So the pasture seeds. So because we're certified organic, we have a bit more. Uh, a bit more shopping to do, shall we say. We need to get certified organic seed, um, but we we work with Albert Lee Seed House in Minnesota and also Welter Seed in Iowa. And those two companies have really be, kind of become like Midwest leaders in organic seed production. And so we're, we're happy about about um, seed, seed availability from, from those guys and if we if we uh, have any problems, I guess there are other options, but but yeah, the the bluegrass, perennial ryegrass. Uh, there's a couple kinds of fescue. There's any fescue works really for me. I like red clover a lot. Red clover is a really cheap and quick way. It's almost like fail-proof uh, or foolproof. Um, it, it grows in lots of conditions. So we we've been we've been pretty happy with with uh, with our pasture approach, but but we haven't we we find that it's really important to again not have so many animals uh, designated per acre. In, in other words, you can't be too greedy. You've got to allow you have to allocate enough land to get your get your stocking density. I say stocking density that means how many animals are out there per acre. So again, like six sows per acre. Is a good a good number. Um, you don't want too many more than that, because otherwise it gets hard to do to manage it this way, and you end up with just barren landscapes and mud. And I've I've seen so many farms that have that issue, and I used to have that issue. And and it's, the simple thing is is to get a plan to establish pasture and and allocate enough of your land to to get reach that six thousand per acre or less. Jude, what yes, would your suggestion be for those who want to seed their pastures for um, like forage quality and provide kind of like a forage resource for pigs? So I don't, I'm not sure that I agree totally with the idea that you can raise pigs on forage. I see people trying that all the time. I've tried it here and there are some breeds of sows who have part of their stomach, part of their GI tract capable, technically capable of, of digest, properly digesting forage. I guess all sows have sort of that, but beyond like a gestation or pregnant sow, um, it's hard for me to see anything that any, any like, based on my experiences here, like, there isn't that much to be gained from feeding forage to pigs for fattening um, because 
you could probably fill their stomachs, but they're not growing very much or very fast. And I'm sure it's costing you more in the long run because the time it's taking to get them to market is increasing. And therefore, um, because in that time, you're, you're spending money to care for the pig in other ways, labor, other costs. Um, I, I'm not sure that the, 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 the goal of this forage program should be fattening a pig. The goal of the program for me is number one, to preserve soil, um, to keep the landscape intact. And probably a close, a close second to that goal is providing a high welfare environment for the pigs who are living out here so they can express their natural instincts to forage in this grass. I would say the number three uh, objective here is, like I said, sows who are adults have some ability to digest forage. So during their pregnancy, that, that's a way to uh, replace purchased or purchased or homegrown grains uh, in, in their diet. Um, but again, for, for growing pigs, I'm not sure that there, there's anything to be um, gotten there. Sure. And while you are in the pasture, can you talk about how your production flow a little bit more and how you schedule, um, you know, when you're farrowing to then when you're weaning and then when pigs are then sent out to market? Yeah, so it's really important. Uh, it took me a long time to learn to, to, to schedule the production so we could have fresh meat all the time because the traditional way of raising pigs is seasonal, right? Once upon a time, you had pigs that were like, let's say the mother of the sow was bred around Christmas time and she would give birth in early spring. And then those pigs could be raised throughout the growing season when the weather was good. And when the pig had to be fattened, you used the grain crop that was harvested in the fall to add the final fattening. And then you butchered it and you would salt away the pork for winter. And then farmers started to do twice a year farrowing, which was popular in Iowa when I was, well, before I was born, but it was popular in Iowa one time. So you had pigs in the spring and fall only. And then there was sort of this downtime, but all of that does not allow fresh, constant supply of fresh pork. And there's two really good arguments about this. Some people would say that in a world where uh, the farm's carbon footprint is a big consideration, that we need to go back to seasonal meat supplies. Um, I don't disagree with that. I simply would, would contend that that message hasn't reached uh, many customers because although a lot of, um, let's say, retail customers we have and some restaurants talk about things like that, when it comes right down to it, they just want fresh meat every week. And so we have to be, the farm has to be um, sort of in a stance to, and be organized in a way to provide that fresh meat. So to do that, we have to organize the breeding uh, in a certain way. And what we do is we take the number of sows we have on the farm, which is, like I said, roughly 100. So we take that divided by four because I want to farrow every six weeks. So that means in about 24 weeks, you have all of your groups uh, th work like through the cycle one time. So it means you can, in one year or 12 months, you can do about two point, let's say 2.2 times 2.2 cycles per sow. That means one sow will give birth two times. She will raise her pigs to, or excuse me, 2.2 times and wean her pigs 2.2 times. And that means, like I say, every six weeks, we've got this group of pigs being born. And also every six weeks, therefore a group of pigs being weaned. And therefore every six weeks, that group of pigs should theoretically be ready to, to butcher. But because all these pigs grow in a bell, sherb, a bell, bell curve shape, a bell curve shape, Therefore, we can take that six divided by three. We have two week intervals. So we have two weeks apart uh, for every group of, or every part of that bell curve. So the really fast growing pigs will be to market first and then the middle group of the pigs will be to market second. And the let's say slower growing pigs will be uh, to market at the end of that, of that six week time frame. And so every two weeks we butcher pigs and 
we have been able to convince our customers that um, ordering once in two weeks is acceptable, even though they would like to order once every week. We just can't make every week work. Uh, we do it every two weeks. Um, so Jude, that means, yes. Do you, oh, sorry to interrupt you, but do you have um, any boars on farm or are you purchasing genetics? So we buy our boars. The, the, so the, the male pig, the father pig is a Berkshire. We buy that from a Midwest um, boar stud uh, west of me at Winthrop, Iowa, that sells American Berkshire boars. And do you have how many boars do you have on the farm? We we only have one boar on the farm because we oh, okay. we only use the boar for breeding gilts, and we otherwise we um, I used to collect my own semen from that boar, but. I don't really have the right equipment uh, for that. And it's a little dangerous, frankly. So we decided to start buying semen from a, that same boar stud. Um, and it's really, it works really well. They can deliver it um, by FedEx or UPS um, any, you know, any weekday. So we can have, if I want 25 uh, doses or bottles of semen, I can get them if I call 24 hours ahead of time. It's actually been a good thing for us. I know not everyone not everyone in the in the in the country has such a nice um, option, but we do in Iowa. Got it. And yeah, on so, the oh, go ahead. I was just going to finish up about about the the breeding schedule to talk about the days that we do things here. Um, we we every like I said every six weeks we wean pigs, and so we do that on a Thursday, always on a Thursday. The reason for that is that the sow will be coming back in heat. So she's coming back in estrus about five days or four days after that. So trying to avoid having to do these intensive jobs on weekends has been a really important thing I've learned when have, when, because you have to have a farm staff. And I also hopefully would like to have some kind of personal life. So. So we, we decided to do it on Thursday because that means uh, four to five days later is like early the next week, right? Tuesday or Wednesday. That means you can do your, you can plan to order your semen, have your semen available, breed the sows on the next week on Tuesday or Wednesday. And all, all this stuff you will find it's really important as your farm gets bigger than just a few pigs or just yourself. So go ahead, Salise. Yeah, we have a, uh, several questions here and then just um, being mindful of time as well. Um, so we have uh, on, the, on, the, on the topic of greed, um, we had an individual ask a question about um, Berkshires and Chester Whites, like what they're known for and maybe why you selected for those two breeds and what characteristics they have. So the yeah, that's a good question on breeds. Uh, Berkshires have become in the last maybe 20 or 25 years in the US and other parts of the world really recognized because of the meat quality. It's kind of like Angus beef. Everyone knows Angus beef, right? So Berkshire is sort of that for, for pork. And so the Berkshire is known for meat quality. Unfortunately, the downside of that is they're not known to grow very fast and they're not known to, the, the mothers, the sows are not known to get lots of piglets in their litters. <clears throat> so we have to try as farmers to, I feel, make a product to sell, which is as economical as we possibly can. So getting more piglets born is a great way to divide costs out. So we, that's one of the reasons we're using Chester Whites. Chester Whites are also an old heritage American breed, but they are known to get more piglets born and their meat quality is not bad. So we might make a slight compromise on meat quality, but we're making everything much more economical for the farm by including Chester Whites. Other white breeds like, like traditional Landrace or Large White or Yorkshire get maybe even more piglets born, but the meat quality is really atrocious on most of those breeds. So that's why we don't use things like that. 
Gotcha. Um, on on the topic of vows, what do you do when you retire them? Uh, are they sold for me, or do you sell them live to other other farmers? So the sow, after she's let's say no longer reproductively functional, which could be anywhere from three or four litters all the way up to like some sows can go 10 or 12 litters. What tends to happen is their body mass increases to a, to a point like more than 500 pounds or even 600 pounds. So a sow that weighs that much is not very pr practical for breeding. They get too big for the hut. They're, they eat too much feed. So at that point, I feel like it's a better decision to, to butcher that sow. Uh, we don't have our own sausage uh, developed. So we don't, because, well, because sows are usually only used for, for making sausage. So we don't okay. butcher them for our, for our own customers. We sell them to a, an Iowa packing company who does that. Okay, great. Um, and also on, yes, I think so. Also on the topic of breeding, what is your insemination success rate? So this this is a something we've sort of struggled with over the years. You might say at one time it could range from, let's say, as low as 50% all the way up to 90%. And we really worked on that for a long time. And now I feel like we're getting very good at that. Uh, Nelson, who you just uh, saw helping me with the camera, is very good at that. He's my main person now with, with um, artificial insemination. And so we've gotten, let's say, averaging 80% on the first time. And then three weeks later, because the sow's estrus cycle is 21 days, if one of those um, sows wasn't in pregnant, wasn't pregnant, pregnant from the first insemination, she'll come back to heat. And then the second time we can, we can breed them again. And we generally get over 90% or more of our group bred that way. Mm -hmm. And of course you have the odd one falling out that we then have to have to call from the herd. But it's, it's I feel like we've really made strides in that over the last few years. Going back to, um, you know, pasture mixes, um, the question here is about your, about how you mentioned using annual ryegrass. Um, and when are your paddocks seeded in relation to when you farrow on them? So annual ryegrass is uh, is part of part of our mix, but the overall mix, like I say, has more perennial grasses. And so just having another look out, out to this field that we were that I'm next to right now. Um, so that this section on the right, you can kind of see the dividing line if you look right right there. So the section on the right was seeded last fall, like in late September. And it's really matured well. It's really thick. And we won't use this, we won't use anything in this field, which is about five and a half acres, until November. Um, and south of that section and to the left or north of that section is a newer section we seeded in April of this year. It's also done well. We've had great rain here and um, the right temperatures. So this is actually a kind of banner year for pasture uh, regeneration. But I guess the dates are somewhat, depending on where you are and your, they could be variable. Awesome. Um, so we're coming at the end of time, Jude. I don't know if you have any kind of last words or parting words you want to share with folks. So yeah, just I just really feel like this is an opportunity for everyone to think about where their meat comes from because I know recent events, at least in North America, because of the, the crisis, have illustrated the some of the practices in packing plants and from big big meat companies. And if you take that in consideration with um, you know the the climate change concerns. I I I hold dear, um, and and a concern for long-term stewardship of our great soil. Then you should seriously think about uh, where your meat comes from and 
um, the and, and it's important to get the details because there's lots of um, uh, big companies who who are trying to uh, sell meat, and they they're simply using just these generic sort of greenwashed terms. I say greenwashing, uh, it just means um, sort of really describing practices about your farm that you think the public uh, wants, but your farm's practices really aren't that way. So be sure to look for third-party certification for your meat. Even if it's not organic, look for something like animal welfare or or even take a tour to your to the farmers who are at your farmer's market. Go see their farm, you know? It's really, really rare that I have people come out here to the farm. Um, and I find that, find that kind of stunning sometimes because it's important to learn these details. So. So yeah, educate yourself, I guess, is my, is my message. And uh, thanks for, for paying attention to me. Yes, hopefully sometime soon, uh, either next year, we'll all be able to come and visit. That would be awesome. <laughs> Alrighty, so we are at, and we've reached our time. Um, Jude, do you mind if we share your email with folks oh, if they wanna certainly. get in go contact ahead. with you? Yeah, go ahead, certainly. Great. So if folks are interested in connecting with Jude or if you have any uh, follow-up um, comments or questions, I have uh, posted his email address in the chat box. Um, in the meantime, uh, you'll find a full list of our upcoming virtual field days on our website. Also, please take a few minutes to complete the evaluation we just posted in the comment box. Um, and then for participating, you'll be entered to win a PFI water bottle. And most importantly, we'll receive your feedback. And um, so once again, thank you so much, Jude, for taking the time out of your day to host us at your farm. And thank you to all who have joined us today. We have some really great questions um, in the chat box. So thank you so much. Please like or share this event so other folks um, can kind of learn and it can be reached out to more people. And we'll say goodbye until next time. Everyone be safe and stay healthy. Thank you so much. Bye-bye. Bye, everyone.